now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the work we've done from FAO. And uh, the first piece in relating to what we just heard in our previous presentation is you see here, this is the FAO Animal Health uh, logo, now updated to include a dog. That's a major step for us. We've traditionally been a livestock organization um, within the animal health work of FAO. So being able to uh, acknowledge the work that we're doing, um, particularly in rabies, is, uh, is very important for us. So what we wanted to do is have a little discussion uh, with a little bit uh, higher resolution in terms of looking down at the ground with some granularity about what rabies control looks like and how we can relate that all into our practical work. Um, and to, uh, to help me with that, I've been fortunate uh, to have also a guest uh, join us. Um, and uh, we have by remote uh, video link um, from the foothills of the Himalayas, uh, Her Majesty the Rabies Virus. So uh, thank you for joining us today. I know you're very busy. Uh, you have a lot of work. You're working 24 hours a day. But really, it means a lot. Thanks for, for being here today. Hello. The pleasure is indeed all mine. So, uh, well, thank you. Um, I mean, this is a dog population management conference, so we heard you, you like dogs, is that right? I, I like cats also. You like cats also. What, dogs and uh, goats? Do you like goats, cattle? Oh, yeah. Goats and cattle are delicious also. Okay. Uh, monkeys? you like monkeys? Monkeys are fine as well. Okay. What about uh, humans? What do you think about humans? Humans? Yeah, no, like the people in the room. Can you see us? See all these humans here? Oh, you mean the bald monkeys. Oh, yes, you are delicious also. Okay, yes, we are. Uh, yep. Um, so while we have you here, can you just tell us then what is different about dogs? I mean, why do we have to have you at the dog population management conference and not about all these other conferences about these other animals? You don't know why I like dogs so much? No, I mean, could you just tell us and make it a lot quicker if you could just explain yourself? Well, you bald monkeys have the big brains. Why don't you figure it out for yourselves? Okay, all right, well, let's do a little bit of work then. So let's try. What is different about the rabies virus in dogs? But let's translate this to epidemiology terms. Why does the virus sustain itself better in canine populations than other populations? So let's just think about it. Now, one thing we know from some of the other species that we've uh, heard about is that dogs are particularly social animals. And we'll go into that a little bit more later. But obviously, we need contact, uh, a lot of contact, to be able to transmit the virus. But the second part you know, is a bit more specific to dogs. So let's take a look at this here. What is this dog? What's happening here? Oh, oh, no, stop. Oh, OK. They were just playing. Thank God. OK, but we know, many people in this room, that dogs interact with the world with their teeth. It's how they communicate. And of course, that makes them an ideal host for the rabies virus, unlike, say, cats. Cats interact with the world, how? With their claws. Of course, the rabies virus doesn't transmit through the claws. So we see why, and particularly for canines, why we have an ideal host. The next part of the discussion goes into the principles of control of diseases, which is you know, more or less universal. Um, so if you've seen the movie Contagion, they actually describe this uh, model as well, because it's so fundamental to how we stop disease outbreaks. And basically, it is called the r naught, which is the basic reproductive number. And it just tells you, if there's one infected animal in a new population, how many new animals will get that disease from that one animal. And that gives you a sense as to how the disease will spread. So an example we have here is measles, which is highly contagious. It's always in the news now. Um, and you'll understand why, because the r naught is 10. So that means if one person gets measles in a completely naive population, on average, 10 people will be exposed and um, infected from that one person. But for disease control, it means that if the R is greater than one, then over time, the number of infections will increase. This outbreak will grow. If we can have it equal to one, then we have a stable situation. And when we get the R below one, that's when we actually start to see disease um, become less common over time. And in particular, the closer the R gets to zero, the faster the time to elimination. All right? So that's kind of all we need to know about R. So let's now look at the R naught for humans. So what is the R naught for rabies in humans? Zero, all right? Humans are a dead end host. So the, all this tells us to epidemiologists is that nothing that we will do with humans, treating humans, preventing humans, nothing is actually gonna affect the prevalence of the disease itself because it's actually not circulating in humans, it's circulating in dogs. 
You know, I was really worried when Louis Pasteur discovered how to stop me in the 1980s. But then he started vaccinating humans, not dogs. <laughs> yeah, and this is a little bit embarrassing for us. Yeah, unfortunately, that great vaccine and a great scientist, but we did vaccinate the wrong animal. All right. So, thank you for pointing that out, Ms. Rabies virus. Now, in terms of affecting the R, there's three components here that we look at. This is a simple model again. It just looks at the transmissibility, okay, which means if uh, there's a contact between two animals, will the dis disease be transmitted? How many contacts happen over time? And then how long you're infected for? If you can decrease any of these three factors, you'll decrease the spread of the disease. You'll decrease the R. So now what we'll do is we'll look at the common tools that we in the veterinary community have had available to us. And you see here the oldest tool. Uh, the tool that is now uh, thankfully becoming a uh, thing of the past, which is stamping out, destroying populations of animals to immediately stop the spread of disease because it will immediately decrease the contact rate. Okay? But notice here, stamping out is not culling. Culling is reducing population size. Stamping out was a tool to actually eliminate a population to prevent spread. The next uh, one here you have is, is vaccination. And you see vaccination can have an impact on both reducing transmissibility and the time of infection. It can even prevent infection altogether. Sterilization, uh, when uh, implemented appropriately, you can decrease contact rate with sterilization in selected situations. And if you have rapid response, um, you could potentially detect and respond to, to animals as they, they get rabies. Um, but it's also extremely challenging. We'll get into that in a moment. So why is it so difficult to rely on case detection to control rabies in dogs? Because this is what we hear frequently from, we were talking about the challenges we have with the vet community, with uh, human health. Um, typically, we control diseases by finding them and responding to them. That's traditionally how, again, we've, we've started our control programs. But in rabies, we have a conundrum here. This is uh, a great slide developed by the team at Glasgow showing the path the virus takes from the time of bite as it moves to the brain. This entire period, we cannot detect the disease, we cannot tell if this dog is rabid. And that can take, on average, about two months. And then for four days, the dog is rabid, the dog is uh, infectious, and it's only in that time period that we can detect this rabid dog. So at any given time, if we could detect all the rabid dogs in a community, we'd only be detecting about 10% of the rabid dogs because the other 80 to 90% of them would be incubating. So you would never actually win if you just rely on case detection. So we have a very long incubation period, a very short clinical period, and that's really difficult for disease control. Um, the second issue, though, relates to uh, a story that we have here from uh, Good Girl. This is a dog that we vaccinated during a study to look at collar duration. So the day before vaccinating, we took these photos, and I actually took this photo myself. I was about one meter from the dog, as you can see. The next day, uh, we came back and vaccinated her. She actually has a collar on, you can't see in the photo. Uh, and we used the net so she got a little bit uh, winded. And the woman at this, this was in a restaurant, this dog had been with her for uh, a few months, and she says, oh, her name is Good Girl. She comes here every day, but she's act been acting strange recently. And of course, we all perked our heads, strange? What do you mean, strange? She says, oh, um, I think uh, she may have bitten someone. So we went and chased down the person who was bitten. His name was William. He was a meatball vendor on the street. And sure enough, he had a bite in his ankle. Now, we then had to go and find Good Girl. Uh, we were able to uh, successfully uh, catch her. She was euthanized, tested, and tested positive for rabies. But we asked William, when were you bit? And William said, well, I was bit yesterday morning. So we went and looked back at the data, and we had this photo. And this photo was taken the afternoon of that day. So this is a dog in a furious phase of rabies. And even myself, you know, very humbling to say that, you know, we cannot appreciate this disease and we cannot detect it. So it's not only the issue about having surveillance systems, it's very difficult to detect, just fundamentally. So we really have to look at biting as our way to do that, and that's why we have integrated bite case management. We'll be hearing more about that in a later presentation. So why not just call the dogs? Okay, when we know for us culling, we have to kill all the animals, but this actually only temporarily decreases the contact rate. We only temporarily decrease the r naught because dogs are social animals, and those contact rates remain quite durable even as densities decrease. And this was done 
through uh, pretty intensive field work uh, by Katie Hampson herself, observing individual dogs and how they interacted with each other uh, when they had rabies. Okay. And finally, obviously, it decreases community support. So if we're going to be moving towards vaccination, it's very difficult to go and vaccinate when the year before you were going out to kill. No, it doesn't bother me at all if you kill dogs. But, I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it's your host, so it, doesn't it have any impact on you at all? Dogs are always good at making new packs, so no problem at all for me to find new hosts. Well, if that's the case, then, then why is that still uh, done so commonly? Why do we keep killing dogs? Because you bald monkeys have the big brains, but, but always forget the facts. So coming back to our big brains and our failure to use them. All right, so let's look at vaccination. Let's try to use our brains here. So vaccination, it has, again, this double impact on the R. Okay? And for effective vaccination, we want to make sure we have an efficacious vaccine. And the vaccine we have is remarkably efficacious. It's efficacious against every strain of rabies anywhere in the world, that original strain that Pastor isolated. So that's very unique. Secondly, we have now long-lasting immunity because that same strain that Pastor isolated has now been developed and is incredibly immunogenic. So now we have already at least two vaccines that are globally available that can produce three years of immunity with one dose. So that's already pretty remarkable. So now let's look at the next component here. Let's look at the R in dogs. What's the R not of rabies in dogs? I know a few people here know. You want to? Between one and two. Again, from that, uh, that groundbreaking field work of actually tracking dogs. Between one and two. So on average, a rabid dog will spread the disease to one or two dogs. Okay. So now the next question is, what's the percentage of the population we need to vaccinate? in order to protect the entire population from that disease, okay? In order to get this R below one. This is a mathematical model, and it's related to the R naught. It's one minus one over R naught. So if we just took now the average R from that previous study, 1.5, then technically, to protect a population, we would need a distribution of 33% of the dogs being immune. So in general, across that population, a third of the dogs being immune would prevent the virus from becoming established. That would be the minimum coverage. Okay, and this tells you the relationship here. The lower the R, the lower the herd immunity required. Okay, and you know, we talked about measles before. So measles has an R of 10. So the minimum herd immunity you need is nearly 100. And that's why we're struggling with measles vaccination now in people. But there's another kind of unique relationship here is that we see a number of these diseases, smallpox, rinderpest, polio, FMD, measles. What's unique about all these diseases is that they've all been successfully controlled or even eradicated through using vaccination. Smallpox eradicated, rinderpest eradicated, polio. Right? So where does rabies fall on this graph? Because that one we've had no success at all. Right? Rabies is down here. It's on this really asymptotic section of the graph where even small changes in vaccination can have dramatic impact on the spread of the virus. So when we show this to our human colleagues, you know, we work in this one health environment, and we present this information, we ask this question. So asking our human epidemiologists, why if the R is so low, why haven't we controlled the disease? And really, this was the literal answer they gave. That's a good question. I don't know, but you know, again, looking at it very logically, the only answer we can give is that we have not focused enough on vaccinating dogs. All right, so that's what our data will tell us. I'm beginning to not like this presentation very much. Well, you don't like it when we talk about vaccination in dogs? What's the problem? I hate antibodies in dogs. Oh, antibodies. So you actually, you can't tell which dogs have been vaccinated or not, right? And once you hit the antibody, you can't reproduce anymore. Yes. It's like falling into a hidden trap. Okay. So we shift our idea about dog vaccination. It's not about protecting people. It's about killing the virus. Excuse me, rabies virus. I don't Salt you there. But so once we have high vaccination coverage, what else can we do? Okay? And it's keep dogs alive. These vaccinated dogs are pathways to freedom, are pathways to killing the virus. So we want to decrease that population turnover. And how do we decrease population turnover? I mean, this is the group that knows more about this than anyone else in the world. Okay? It's the work that you're doing, the work that you've been discussing in such great detail. We have to take better care of dogs. So it's exactly the opposite of our tendencies in the past. 
Instead of killing the dogs, we actually need to vaccinate them, support them, and they will go out and kill the virus for us. Because there's no use of having antibodies in a dead dog. So now we understand herd immunity a little bit more. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the target population. So which dogs are the most important to vaccinate in order to have the greatest impact on the R? Are all dogs created equal? No. Okay, we want to have the dogs with the highest likelihood of encountering the virus. Again, we're shifting to an offensive strategy. This is about killing the virus, not about protecting people. So the dogs we want to get are the dogs that are not kept in enclosed areas. And this is really uh, crucial for us. So these are the roaming dogs, unknown dogs. Okay. And we have a little video here to show what this looks like. This was actually uh, taken in uh, Bali during one of the campaigns. And while driving through the road, it was 2 in the morning, a dog came out and was barking. And you see that dog has been vaccinated, has a collar. But what was really interesting here is that as this dog got nervous and ran away from me, he calls for help. <laughs> There he goes, and now who comes along? His little buddy, all right? A little buddy also vaccinated. So now in the middle of the night, with all our foo-foo dogs at home sleeping next to their owners, we have the real, okay, warriors on the street doing their job protecting the community. And it was this video and this work demonstrating that that helped to change uh, the perception of vaccinated dogs. And what we'd like to emphasize as well, okay, is that at night, the virus doesn't stop working. We go to bed, we like to have eight hour work days, the virus doesn't, okay? And luckily we have dogs as the master of that environment. They are the masters of the night and they're looking out for us when we're asleep. This is turning into a terrible presentation, terrible. Oh, but I mean, we're, we've got to learn. We've got to learn from our mistakes, right? Damn you veterinarians, always giving away my secrets. All right, so. Now, what's the best way to vaccinate these outside dogs? Okay. We've done a lot of work on this. Vaccinate them while they're still puppies. It's easier to vaccinate puppies. Now, there are some challenges to that, and uh, Darren will be going into this in his uh, presentation later. But just in terms of efficiency, you can get uh, very quick coverage by going from them when they're young. The second one is this issue of collars. You sort of saw that, uh, that video, but it's this that's happening in communities. When we see a dog like this, someone may think that this dog is maybe not as valuable as other dogs, but this dog is vaccinated, and this dog may be the first one bitten by a rabid dog if it comes into the community. So it's almost like a honeypot. So we wanna make sure that, that, especially these older dogs are supported by the communities, and those collars really help to make that clear that this dog is special, and we need to keep these dogs alive to help us kill the virus. Now the third part here is that sometimes it's very difficult to catch dogs, um, and we know we need a little help with this, so uh, we do use nets. So we have now all the, the boxes checked. And when this was done in Bali, you see the impact. You went from an uncontrolled outbreak to essentially uh, immediate control as a result of the vaccination program. And this happened not in 30 years like in our previous experiences, but in three years. So we can contract the time taken. And that's directly related to dog vaccination. So this was not related to what was happening on human management, it was because of vaccinating dogs. And also didn't relate to killing dogs because actually these two graphs are not the same. This is the human cases, this is the dogs culled. Okay, so dogs culling appear to be largely responsive to the human burden. As humans died, more dogs died. As less humans died, less dogs died. Okay, so have we learned our lesson? I mean, this is what the virus is asking us to do is to use our heads. How are we spending our money? Right. And we had a study here done by Darren in 2005. He said, okay, we're spending about 800 and 580 million dollars a year on rabies. 83% is on post-exposure, 10% is on vaccinating dogs. That's not very good. We spend about eight times as much on vaccinating people who don't have the disease over vaccinating dogs. So this was updated um, 2015. It's not exactly apples to apples, but this is work that uh, Katie Hampson did. And she had this in part of her global burden estimate. Okay. So in the 10 years, okay, we've gone to spending 13 times more on people than on dogs. That's the data. That's the reality. Excuse me, can I ask you all a question now? Yeah, sure. As rabies viruses, we leave simple lives. We seek only brain tissue to reproduce and dog saliva to find new hosts. But you bald monkeys, with all these resources, all these fancy technologies, beautiful hotels, and those huge brains, 
Why do you squander all your resources instead of uniting together and doing what you know needs to be done to stop me once and for all? That's the real question. And we need the virus, unfortunately, to point it out for us. The data is, unfortunately, that we are still losing. Okay? The range is increasing. Human cases are increasing. And why is the virus winning? We know that we're not vaccinating enough dogs, but the data is a bit more disappointing. I mean, this is from the Asia region, that we're not seeing dog vaccination coverage increase. Okay? Our strategy is not working. You say, wait, what do you mean our vaccination strategy is not working? We have the 70% plan. Why doesn't that work? Well, the data from Bali, okay, and here's the data first from human cases dropping to zero with high vaccination coverage, but the animal cases didn't follow the model. And it wasn't until we changed our approach to vaccination that we actually saw our approach elimination. But according to the data, we should have freed Bali with a high probability, according to the models. Okay, and this is the amount of dogs we vaccinated every campaign. Okay, we eventually got up to 333,000 dogs vaccinated, 100,000 more than the first campaign. 1.1 million dogs vaccinated in three years. Right. Data down to every sub-village. But yet, when the data came out, we still found cases circulating throughout the island. It wasn't just one focus. Right. It was still limited circulation occurring. So why did we fail? The data said we should have succeeded with a 95% probability. Do you know anyone else recently who's based on surveys thought they were going to win something and then failed spectacularly? Should we ask Hillary? All right. This is the estimate from the surveys the day before the election. 71% chance of winning. Ah, phew. And we know how that worked out. Right. But why? What we learned later is that there was a systematic bias in those surveys. There was a group that was consistently not included, people who we didn't think were going to be voting. So what does our data show? Well, our data showed 73% coverage, 72% coverage, 92% coverage, 102% coverage. Wow, we vaccinated more dogs than on the island. And actually, these are verified vaccinations. Um, we had very little evidence of actual you know, um, dumping of vaccine or, you know, because collars are being used, so it was actually easy to verify. So how do we vaccinate more dogs and still not succeed? Okay, and more dogs when we run the island. We had a systematic bias against street dogs. They're missing the vaccinations. They're missing the surveys, and they're missing your estimates. And that leads us to underestimating our vaccination coverage and leading us to failure. So we emphasize street dogs. Okay, and finally, this other piece of data, which has recently been included in an OIE publication. You see the fifth campaign and cases rising during the campaign. Very unusual. Okay, and that's because there was a switch in the vaccine, and this vaccine did not appear to be efficacious. Okay, it was a switch to a vaccine that had never been tested before. And it taught us this lesson, that we took too long. We have to be able to maintain a high level of coverage and high quality vaccination until the virus is eliminated. And we have trouble doing that with our current systems. They're taking too long. So what are we going to do? Are yeah, we going to give up? Are we going to keep doing the same thing? Go to another big workshop and talk about what we should do? <laughs> Learn from our mistakes and work harder. OK, so look, what can we do better? OK, we know we didn't do enough street dogs from the beginning, so we know that it can be done, you've seen that. You know that they work better when they compete against each other. And this data is remarkable. This is the, the data when teams were competing in controlled environments that were safe. And they vaccinated 50 dogs per day on the first day of competition. But one team got 100 street dogs. And the other teams were incredulous. They said, that's not possible. They went back the next day. This was the very next day. They all doubled their outputs just by that little bit of peer pressure. And this is the moment. This is the moment of releasing the results. This is as the anticipation hits. Oh my god! I mean, the room was shaking. They couldn't believe how many dogs they were vaccinating. There was so much excitement, all right, so much motivation. And by the time they finished, they went from vaccinating 50 dogs per day per team to 210 <laughs> dogs per team per day. Four times more than they started with and more than we ever thought possible. So what we bring together is that this teamwork actually can cover large areas in short periods of time. This is an area that was poorly covered because of political issues. Okay? But through vaccination teamwork of eight teams, in a very short period of time, they could get that entire area covered and get sufficient coverage. And it's not just work for men. This is a team of female vaccinators in Flores who actually did an excellent job, hit 80% coverage. And the champion team that we saw before, getting the championship trophy from the head of livestock services. That video you saw before, eight team, it's now been seen 7.5 million times. It's gone viral without our effort. Right, there's a lot of interest in this work, and how do we harness that? So we said, how can we work together to get everyone in the same place at the same time 
learning, competing, building capacity. And this is where the race proposal came together, a race to eliminate rabies. A place where we can work together, helping each other to learn how to best eliminate rabies as efficiently as possible through a center of excellence. Okay? So quickly going through this, you've seen these components that we work stronger together. This will be interagency, not just government, but our NGOs together as well, and uh, collaborating countries, using healthy competition, being as cost efficient as possible, and using our currently available resources. All right, so first step is establishing the race. The race center will be announced on World Rabies Day. Um, this is funded through a regional project uh, in FAO uh, regional office in Asia. Okay? And we'll have a component about building capacity for street dog vaccination, developing a more effective monitoring system, using tools that we already have and some of the tools that already Gark has presented and uh, we heard from HSI as well today on those. And then looking at a more rapid protocol for vaccination of street dogs. Because ultimately we'll have to figure out how to shorten that time and we'll be using this uh, program to also do that together with our modeling experts. So what do we need to do right now? All right, we need to go, get in shape. We've got a lot of work to do, a lot of exercise. There are some uh, videos online that you can go search. Just search Bali Method Vaccination for that. So rabies virus, what do you think? Mm. You ready? Well, you've certainly learned a few lessons, but I'll believe it when I see it. If this is a race, I've already been winning it for 1,500 years now. That's true, but it's different now because we've got street dogs on our side. Yeah, touche, bald monkeys, touche. The race is on. That's great. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to our uh, rabies virus extraordinaire and great organizer. Thank you, Ellie, for that great work. Thank you.